Hey, this is Tim Leahy, and today we're going to talk about pneumonia, its uh, diagnosis and causes. Pneumonia is a super common cause of death. About five and a half million people die a year from it, and you can see there's a lot of morbidity associated. In the United States, it's actually the eighth leading cause of death still. How does it happen? Well, it turns out there are three major contributors. You can get bugs in your lungs. That happens all the time. If you get too much, that's a problem. If your immune system freaks out about those bugs, that can cause edema and problems, symptoms. And occasionally, you can get sort of spread to the lungs from some other place, like uh, from bacteremia, pancreatitis kind of thing. So invasion happens because basically we all you know, swallow a little bit in the way of bugs into our lungs all the time, and typically our immune systems defend against it. If it's not a micro-aspiration, but a massive aspiration, that can overwhelm the immune system. Uh, or you know, it can be just that our immune system, for instance, can't defend against that micro-aspiration uh, in that moment. We can inhale something like tuberculosis, or as I mentioned, you could get some bloodstream pathogen like staph straight into your lungs. Inflammation is a key. You know, partly you need to defend against that invasion, but partly you need not to freak out about that invasion. And so it's a fine balance. Essentially, sort of overly simplistically, neutrophils show up, cytokines fly left and right, blood vessels get leaky, edema happens. That response protects, but it also can clog airways with mucus and snot and repair gas exchange and give symptoms. So what are the weakened defenses that might make somebody susceptible to getting pneumonia? You know, uh, you know, relatively uncommonly, there are things like primary immunodeficiencies. More commonly, HIV starvation can weaken immune defenses. And sometimes we do this to people. We give steroids or chemotherapy for things. Perhaps even more commonly than that, you could be unconscious and not protect your airway or have some sort of a, you know, a neurological problem that makes it so that uh, aspiration happens, you know, multiple sclerosis. All of these things in this list are things that sort of alter the usual defensive architecture and make you susceptible to pneumonia. Alcohol does a lot of these things. It impairs mentation, impairs neurological function, etc. So one of these things happens when you get pneumonia. What does it look like? So the symptoms are actually kind of diffuse. These are the most common ones that really should trigger it. Fatigue, cough, myalgia, fever, dyspnea. You know, really cough and fever are kind of the cardinal ones. But as you see, you know, a lot of these symptoms are things you can get from uh, uh, other, other things. So they're not super specific. Pleurisy, pain if you take a deep breath is really useful, much more specific, but you know what? It's also uncommon. So, you know, let's say a patient has something that makes you think, ah, oh, maybe that's pneumonia. Very important to do a little bit of detective work to round out the story. Does that person have TB risk factors? Does that person have travel to an area where there's an outbreak of pneumonia, say, you know, an area where influenza is prevalent? Do they have unusual exposures that might give them risks of unusual kinds of pneumonia? Animal exposures, mold risk factors. So now you're thinking, okay, I think, I think they have pneumonia. You're getting some ideas about where it might be coming from. And then you, you know, Examine the patient, see what kind of clues you can find there. And the kind of clues you're looking for are vital sign, instability, and signs of infection, like fever. And then in the lungs, you're sort of looking for signs that there's edema in the airways, that you could have crackles, dullness to percussion, egophony, whispered pectoralically, and we'll talk about some of those signs in class. There are also sort of some you know, less specific signs of pneumonia that are important to take note of, either because somebody is frail and elderly and maybe won't show you the cardinal signs, or because you want to have a sense of how sick they are. So altered mutation shock, respiratory compromise. What else might signal pneumonia? You know, if somebody has an elevated white count suggestive of, of uh, you know, inflammation, that might be pneumonia. Acidosis could suggest sepsis and, you know, shock, uh, poor tissue perfusion. Hypoxia could be a clue. All of these things are sort of loose clues. Microbiology stuff is only useful if super clearly positive. You know, sputum culture with a bunch of stuff from your non-sterile mouth, ah, who cares? But if it's clearly showing a pathogen like strep pneumo, that can be helpful. Blood culture is a positive sort of nails that there's an infection going on. And occasionally you could do like a nasal swab for uh, influenza or other viruses to sort of say, oh, it is that. So sputum gram stain is one thing you'll see. And so here you can see these little gram positive, purplish little dealy boppers. A couple times you'll see them in pairs here, a couple times in chains. That looks like uh, streptococcus to me. Look at these clusters of gram positive cocci. They almost look like little bunches of grapes. That's staph aureus, uh, common to certain types of pneumonia. Look at these pinkish rods here. These are gram-negative rods. I don't know, maybe it's uh, some kind of E. coli. The chest x-ray, by contrast, is much more useful in pneumonia. If you really suspect the, the person has a pneumonia, this is where you go. What's wrong with this chest x-ray? Absolutely nothing. This is a normal chest x-ray. Where's the abnormality here? Yeah, right there on the left side. A little bit on the right here, right? Where's the abnormality? Right side, up on the top, makes you wonder if it's a little cavitary circular, circular there. Here you have it on both sides, a little bit of interstitial airway edema on both sides. What's the story here? Totally clear on the right in this overexposed thing, maybe a little bit of a hyperinflation, but here you can kind of see a meniscus. This is a pleural effusion. And here you have clearly cavitary pneumonia, these little 
circular air-filled cavities here, suggestive of an upper lobe cavitary process, might make you want to think about tuberculosis. This is just a mess, and what you often see in the ICU, this person is intubated, has a line, there's you know, EKG stuff on the outside of the body all over the place, and then both lungs are abnormal, and eh, is there pneumonia in there or not? It's a hard call, but there could be. So look for infiltrates focally. Look for empyemas, which is what you would think a pleural effusion is, if it's pneumonia, or abscesses. And, you know, the problem is that if you're adding up all of this data and sort of saying, what about my symptoms? What about the white count? What about the chest x-ray? Which one is the magic combination that will tell you the answer every time? The answer is none of them will. They all have sensitivity and specificity problems. If they're sensitive, they're not very specific. And if they're specific, they're not so sensitive. Maybe, you know, the best one is, a, is you know, sort of two or three of the things that would make you worry about pneumonia plus a positive chest x-ray, but, you know, not perfect. So, you know, let me just make you feel more depressed that, you know, particularly in the people that you worry about who are vulnerable to pneumonia, it's harder to see. Their symptoms aren't as obvious. They might not make the white count, the, the other signs of it. I think you can trust a chest x-ray more in them, but you just have to be more specific, suspicious in them. So, essentially, you got this very complicated Venn diagram. You have to take their symptoms exam, epidemiology, chest x-ray labs, and micro, and put it together and sort of say, does it look like pneumonia? Let, let, me, let me just take your anxiety down a little bit here and sort of say it's not quite so bad and that you can use a process. If their symptoms don't suggest pneumonia, you're done. But if you sort of say, ah, oh, it could be pneumonia, you got to listen to their lungs and see if they have any of those signs we talked about. You know, the epidemiology helps you get a sense of how at risk they are, but it's probably not 100% the story. If their exam is normal and they're safe, that's probably not pneumonia. You don't have to go any farther. If either they're fragile, though, or their exam is abnormal, get a chest x-ray. You cannot, let me underline this, you cannot diagnose pneumonia without a chest x-ray. It's inappropriate. So if the diagnosis is abnormal, kaboom. You've got the diagnosis, and you might sort of use the epi in the labs to give you a sense of how bad it is, what kind it might be, but you have the diagnosis if you can get all the way from the left to the right. Once you've made the diagnosis of pneumonia, it's very important to say, what stripe of pneumonia is this? Is this community-acquired, nosocomial, or healthcare-associated, ventilator-associated, aspiration, or is this somebody who's immunocompromised and all bets are off? Why do you care? It's because the bugs that cause this are different. In community-acquired pneumonia, about Half of the time, we don't even know what causes it, but either atypical causes like mycoplasma, chlamydophilia, and legionella are to blame, or strep pneumo and viruses are the problem. So we have antibiotics to cover that. This changes if you go into bad community-acquired pneumonia. Then some of these more virulent pathogens go up the list, particularly staph aureus newly becomes a player here. And, you know, some of the atypicals fall off the list, so you worry much less about, say, chlamydophilia. In hospital-acquired pneumonia, you worry about both MRSA and gram-negative rods more, and notice there are not atypicals on this list. In aspiration pneumonia, you worry about anaerobes. That's because the person has got a whole bunch of junk in there. The typical thing would be our friend on the right here who's drunk and didn't protect his airway and got aspiration pneumonia. And then there are immunocompromised people, and sort of what causes pneumonia in them is beyond the scope of this course, and so I would just sort of say, recognize that if that person is immunocompromised as below, you got to look up and figure out what the story is with them because it's different. Another thing to really sort of trigger that's like that is to say, what are other reasons why it's not your everyday pneumonia? That's not an apple, it's an orange. Immune compromise is one. The other one is, if you see big abscesses, if you see a big empyema, the management and causes of this are going to be different, and so you should sort of think of that as a different entity that you want to learn separately. So let me summarize in ridiculously superficial fashion. You get pneumonia because of aspiration, reduced immunity, or increased inflammation. The symptoms that you typically look for are cough, fever, and dyspnea, but there's nothing simple that nails it. If you suspect it, look on the examination. If either it's abnormal or fragile, you should get a chest x-ray. That is the only way you can make the diagnosis appropriately. You know, the sputum stain, if it's super positive and obviously for a pathogen, okay, good. But otherwise, basically use your clinical judgment to pick what kind of pneumonia it is while you wait for your cultures. And these are the causes of that kind of pneumonia. We'll talk next time about how